So, so let me call this, uh, I guess the same title I called my physics force lecture, which is uh, radiation safety, or as a subtitle, types of radiation. And what I'm trying to replicate here is actually, it's a training that I had to go through. In, in my line of, uh, in my previous research work, uh, we, we had to use a, a radioactive source for a particular project I was working on. So um, we had to get approval for it. We have to get the source from a place at UC Berkeley that keeps them safe. I think they actually, the um, person was from LBL. Um, actually the source we borrowed from LBL, but we had to go through UC Berkeley's uh, EHNS, environmental health and safety or something. Um, so, so if your job requires you to work with uh, uh, radiation or uh, some radioactive source or any other radiation source, you would be required to do, go through a similar type of safety. So the talk that I'm giving is, is not meant to replace that uh, training, which is more comprehensive and you get tested on it. And <laughs> um, But this is as a kind of a taste for people who might be going into those fields, medical um, fields, or people who might never get to those. This is kind of the thing that people in those areas would have to deal with. So I call this subtitle types of radiation because that's the very first thing that you think about. When you think about types of radiation, the very first classification is actually into these two categories. One is what we call non-ionizing radiation. And the other is, I think it's kind of, um, <laughs> it, it's maybe evident from the wording. It's like, you know, there are two types of people, one type that can be put into categories and the other type that cannot be put into categories. Um, so the other is uh, ionizing radiation. By the way, there was a logic paradox joke. Uh, let me stay away from jokes for the time being. Um, so non-ionizing radiation, it, um, it can describe a lot of them. I think uh, the biggest category of non-ionizing radiation is what you might call low energy EM wave, electromagnetic wave. And frankly, a lot falls into this category. There's, here are many of <laughs> those words, which are, uh, so radio waves is one of them. Uh, microwave, Wi-Fi signal, which is uh, technically microwave signal, um, infrared, visible, um, visible. Uh, let me call it visible radiation. Sometimes, if you look at labels on uh, laser pointers, you might see oh, it, it it produces a visible radiation and like visible radiation is perfectly fine and safe as long as you don't shine it into your eye. And even when you do, it just hurts your eye and maybe damages it permanently, but not with laser pointers. Um, and, um, oh, and I guess uh, cell phone signals, um, phone signals, like a 5G. Um, these actually just fall under microwave. Uh, microwave is a, a specification for a range of frequencies in the EM wave spectrum that I think you saw in uh, chapter 12. And uh, it, it's around the gigahertz range and a lot of the, the wireless network signals these days are at that range. Um, they don't necessarily operate at the same frequency as your microwave oven. <laughs> So all these are non-ionizing radiation in the sense that all these have photons, you know, particle of light with not enough energy, not enough to do what? Not enough to, um, not enough to ionize <laughs> the atoms and molecules, not enough energy to give to the electrons to liberate them from atoms and molecules. So, um, and with this non-ionizing radiation, the shortest thing I can say is that it, um, it, there has been no study that has ever shown any kind of uh, health, uh, health uh, uh, danger 
or health hazard that's associated with the non-ionizing radiation. The closest to would be a uh, microwave uh, through the same mechanism as uh, how your microwave ovens work can heat up your body to the degree that it causes burn. But you know, you would feel it as a burn. So um, I see the question, is there a cutoff for what to consider the low, uh, so low power? So the, with the lasers, the kind of power that you are worried about is slightly different because when I say photons with not enough energy, I literally mean photons in the quantum mechanical sense. You saw this expression, energy of photon is a Planck's constant times the frequency. So, um, so with the, with like a laser pointers, with the, uh, like there's a CO2 laser that's used for cutting stuff. Those do not have enough. So no matter how much energy you put into the laser, it will still not cause ionizing. Uh, it will still not cause ionization. Uh, with some of those lasers, like a CO2 lasers, the real danger is a mechanical danger as in you can cut through your arm for one, for some of those. And the biggest hazard with the high powered lasers is usually uh, with your vision eye. That's why people working with the high powered lasers wear goggles. Uh, some of them are meant designed to, to protect against the specific wavelengths that the, wager, the lasers that they're working with operate in. And uh, that's an entirely different safety talk. That's a laser safety talk. <laughs> and I'll just say for a lot of the continuous wave lasers, um, the safety mechanism that we'll, we rely on the most is your blink mechanism. As in, if a, a, uh, if a bright light shines into your eye, we will naturally tend to blink and that'll protect your eye most of the time. Um, in the research settings, people work with the post lasers where a very short pulse can deliver a large amount of energy in a short amount of time. In those cases, your blink response isn't quick enough to actually respond. So, so those are the circumstances where you have to be extremely careful, but those are also research settings where you wouldn't get access to those lasers unless you go through this training. So, so that's enough about non-ionizing radiation. That's a radiation that's totally safe to the extent that we can tell. We don't worry about it. That's frankly not even about the topic of chapter 15. I want to address this because I think as we say in the, the SA assignment, radiation is a loaded word. It's a, uh, particularly in common popular usage, sometimes people get scared whenever they hear the word radiation. And, there's no reason to be, because it could be easily referring to non-ionizing radiation and there's nothing to worry about. Ionizing radiation is the one where you need to take care and you need to, um, you need to respect it. And uh, there are many types of ionizing radiation. Uh, one of them is kind of the exact uh, contrast to, to this. So any high energy, EM wave would be considered that. So what's considered the high energy and looking at this high frequency would start out with the UV rays um, at certain ranges and above UV rays, it's X-rays, magnetic waves that are ionizing radiation. If they have a high enough energy. So, so that's one, but that's not the only one. All types of nuclear radiation is also ionizing radiation, nuclear radiation. So within the context of chapter 15, you have heard the reference to alpha rays and uh, beta rays, and I already mentioned the gamma rays. Yeah, and uh, there are other more less common types of ionizing radiation that you are really only exposed to in specific settings. Either you are out in the outer space or um, you are working with the particle accelerators. So there are other uh, radiations. So if you are out in outer space or you're just a high up, one source of radiation that people think about and make sure that they take into account are cosmic rays. And cosmic rays, what they fundamentally are is mostly high energy protons. 
that have been accelerated uh, to relativistic speeds by something somehow, somewhere. And uh, neutron uh, radiation is another one, but given that uh, free neutron is, um, it's unstable, it decays, and there aren't common processes that just produce neutron other than in like nuclear bombs. <laughs> so uh, neutron radiation is something that you might get exposed to if you are near nuclear reactors or, um, or in a research setting. Um, but there are other sources of radiation that, that, has, that has potential to cause either ionize, ionization directly by imparting enough energy to electrons in atoms and molecules, or they might be producing secondary radiation that causes ionization. Neutron radiation is actually one example that can cause a secondary radiation. If you're looking for a phrase to Google search, you can look up something called nuclear activation, or sorry, not nuclear activation, neutron activation. Uh, um, this is uh, one of the rare circumstances where exposure to radiation actually causes something to be radioactive. Uh, with the alpha, beta, gamma, x-rays, most of the, well, maybe not, alpha, beta, gamma, and x-rays, and UV rays, exposure to those things don't cause the things to become radioactive. Um, but uh, neutron radiation can cause things to become radioactive through the process called neutron activation. So, so that's uh, um, types of radiation. And so when we talk, when we are talking about radiation safety, we are talking about um, if your work or, um, well, if your work <laughs> requires you to somehow become exposed to ionizing radiation, that's where you do the estimate, uh, see if uh, you are in a, situation where you could uh, potentially be, be at a higher risk of getting cancer or danger of death, then, um, then organizations are required to take, required to take uh, necessary steps to make sure that people are safe. And um, I, I will give you, so, okay, I, looking at time and, um, I guess I don't have enough time to talk in detail about alpha rays, beta rays, and gamma rays, other than to refer to this diagram here. So this is a good, nice uh, illustration of those two, three very common nuclear radiation, alpha, beta, and gamma. And, um, and Beta and gamma rays are more like each other than alpha rays as far as radiation safety is concerned. And it has to do with their penetrating power, which is actually how they are named. Uh, Rutherford was basically calling these ABC in Greek uh, in the order of penetrating power from the least to most. Alpha ray has the least penetrating power, beta has the next, and gamma has the next. Um, with the beta rays, the penetrating power of beta ray really depends on its energy. Low energy beta rays can easily get blocked by thin uh, piece of metal like aluminum, uh, like a few centimeters of aluminum can easily show the beta rays. Or in uh, biology research settings, I've seen people use uh, plastic uh, acrylic, like a thick layer of acrylic is enough to block beta rays of certain energies. There are beta rays with a much uh, a higher energy than usual. Those take uh, most care to, require most care to shield. That's where you would want to consult with the people who know what they're doing. Because with a very high energy beta rays, you worry about secondary radiation. As these high energy electrons slow down, they can release their own gamma rays. So if you try to block beta ray, high energy beta rays with the lead shielding, sometimes that produces gamma rays that's not adequately blocked. So, so beta rays is potentially complicated. Gamma ray in some sense is very simple. It's an electromagnetic radiation and um, it, it's like X-ray, so it goes through paper, goes through most uh, metal that's a thin and light in atomic weight like aluminum. Uh, goes through concrete quite easily, really to reliably block gamma rays of uh, varying levels of energy, what you need is a thick lead shielding. 
uh, high and high G, high atomic number material. Lead is the most common one because it's uh, easy to work with and only slightly toxic, only if you eat it. Um, so, um, and even then uh, it, depending on, so I think uh, for every centimeter of lead shielding, gamma ray gets uh, reduced by like 10% or reduced to 10%. So if you're starting with a very high energy gamma ray, it might take centimeters and centimeters of lead shielding to actually block it sufficiently. Um, alpha rays is the most uh, complex one because it um, has the, it's uh, most easily blocked. So, um, so it, um, in some sense, it's easiest to work with because it's mostly easily blocked. Oftentimes you don't even have to shield it. Air around it will naturally shield it for you. So in that sense, it, alpha rays are easy to work with. Uh, in many applications, you don't have to worry about shielding. Uh, you, the dead uh, layers of uh, dead skin cells will stop you, stop the alpha rays. Now, the particular danger with alpha rays is because they are, uh, interact with the surrounding material so easily, if somehow you accidentally get it inside you, then alpha ray sources inside you, it's even more dangerous than beta and gamma rays. Because with the beta and gamma rays, these rays have some chance of escaping your body without hurting you. But uh, with alpha rays, everything that comes from within your body is guaranteed to interact with uh, something inside your body, ionizing it, causing DNA errors that lead to cancer. Um, so, so when people um, do the dose exposure dose calculation, uh, there's a, a factor that applies to just alpha rays. With the alpha ray doses, there's a factor of 10 that applies to it just because that once you are exposed to alpha ray, the chance of interaction with alpha ray and your body is so much greater than with these two. So, Oh, I guess I kind of talked about these uh, radiations a little bit. And the, the talk about those, that's what leads to what I want to get to next, which is a principle that applies in the context of radiation safety. And it's uh, the version I learned is this. Uh, I think there's on other ones that float around. Uh, the version I learned uh, is called ALARA. And it's an acronym for this phrase as low as reasonably achievable. <laughs> um, as low as reasonably achievable in re references to, in reference to dosage or dose of exposure. There's a saying, dose makes the poison. I think it's a saying in medicine. Um, it's a particularly applicable saying in uh, radiation safety. The truth is you are exposed to radiation all the time. As you are watching this video, you are exposed to radiation right now. Uh, we are all exposed to a background source of radiation. Some of that is coming from radioactive elements in the soil. There's some average amount throughout the earth <laughs> and some sites tend to be more contaminated. Whatever the case might be, you're gonna be exposed to some amount of radiation. There's uh, sources of radiation in the food unit. Uh, banana contains potassium and certain fraction of naturally occurring potassium is radioactive. So you are eating radioactive potassium whenever you're eating banana. <laughs> and um, cosmic rays that I referred to earlier, it's coming from sky. So whenever, I think even on the sea level, you are exposed to some cosmic rays. And whenever you are flying in an airliner, you are closer to the source of cosmic rays. So you are getting exposed to more cosmic rays. So, uh, so you are constantly exposed to radiation. So it's not like as though you can, <laughs> um, you, you can just be away from all radiation all the time. That's just not gonna happen. Um, so, uh, so our starting place is that the background level of radiation, it's something that's uh, reasonable. That's uh, something that we have survived with for many, many years, millions of years. So um, even though some of those are probably eventually causing cancer, it's the rate of cancer that we are used to. 
And so, uh, so as our occupation exposes to more radiation sources, cosmic rays are actual source of concern for airline pilots and uh, flight attendants and astronauts. Um, the number that we are comparing to is that uh, level, uh, the background uh, radiation level. Uh, I think for, I was looking this up just before class session, um, think for uh, human adult, the typical amount is something, uh, let me look it up again. Think uh, uh, background radiation exposure. Um, it's uh, usually measured in something called the RAM, uh, radiation equivalent to men. Um, I think this is about right. So the typical background radiation, I guess it says about 300 milliram. That's the uh, annual uh, amount of exposure for someone li living in US. So if a source of radiation that you are thinking about, whether it be cosmic rays for airline pilot or a physics researcher who's working with radioactive source, if you do an estimate for, okay, how much additional radiation you are exposed to, and then let's say your calculation comes down to, let's say three milliram per year, then you would say, oh, that's way less than background. So, so you wouldn't really worry about it too much. And, um, and that's uh, the two sides of this as low as reasonably achievable. Um, as a, so the reasonable part. <laughs> so if uh, the expected uh, radiation exposure is already low, then you don't take extraordinary measures to prevent it further because that would be unreasonable. At the same time, let's say you do the estimate and the estimate comes out to be a 300 milliram. Then you don't say, oh, that's the same as background. Let's ignore it. You don't do that. Um, the principle is as low as, with, uh, as, as low as reasonably achievable. So if there are reasonable precautions that you can take to reduce the level of radiation exposure, then you take it. Uh, it's a trade-off between how much, um, how much more complexity does it cost to your work setting? Uh, that's the kind of the cost in implementing those. And, uh, and the benefit would be you are reducing your radiation exposure. And once you are at the level of background level exposure, then going somewhat below that is probably a good idea if that can be reasonably done. So in implementing those measures, the three uh, levers or three things that uh, we typically do in radiation safety is called um, uh, time, distance, and shielding. I think that was one of the homework questions. And this is, uh, uh, this is ordered in the order of importance. Time is actually the biggest one. It's uh, kind of evident in, um, evident in this uh, background radiation exposure coming as a timed number as annual radiation exposure. So if I'm, um, so as an example of when I was doing physics research work that involved radiation source, then I would do the estimate on time, um, estimating, I don't know, eight hour work day. So whatever level of exposure I was calculating from the location of the radioactive source to where my desk was, I would estimate that, okay, I'm gonna be at my desk eight hours a day and five days a week over a period of a year, how much exposure am I getting? Now, I'm not at my desk all the time. My desk is where I spend most of my time, but there will be times when I work with the radioactive source. So I would be within a few centimeters of the radioactive source and that time would get treated differently. I would uh, estimate, I don't, <laughs> it would depend on the project. <laughs> I would say, okay, uh, on average, I might be spending with uh, 15 minutes per day with this source in very close proximity. And in working out those plans and standard operating procedure, you would uh, limit exposure because that's the simplest and most effective way to uh, limit your danger to any radiation source, limit um, exposure to source. And in fact, uh, if you've ever taken X-rays uh, where you are 
um, aware, uh, like, uh, you know, dental x-rays, you might have noticed that as they are uh, pressing the x-ray button, you might see them step out of the room. It's because the x-ray machine is a, it's a radiation producing machine. It only produces the radiation while it's on. And for you as patient, you get x-rayed only a few times a year. So uh, all those are taken into account. Your doctors figure this is a reasonable amount. You are not at much elevated risk of getting cancer, you are fine. But the technician, that's their job day in and day out. They are pressing the button several times a day. So unless they take extraordinary measures, like stepping out of the room, making sure they are nowhere near the X-ray radiation, over the period of their work, they could be accumulating a lot of exposure to that ionizing radiation. So a lot of workplace safety rules regarding radiation. This is the very first line of defense. You limit exposure to source. If you don't need it to be near the source, then you, you are not, and you arrange the workplace so that that can happen. And that brings us to distance. And um, I keep talking about being near the source. It's because uh, radiation decreases with the distance. All, all, the, all these sources at a minimum follows inverse square law as in their intensity decreases as a uh, inverse uh, reciprocal of a square of the distance. So, you know, gamma ray, I was talking about how it takes uh, centimeters and centimeters of lead shielding to reduce it by, uh, uh, well, it takes at least a centimeter of lead to reduce it by a factor of 10. You know, one way you can easily get a factor of 10 uh, reduction of gamma ray exposure you increase your distance to the gamma ray source by a factor of three. Three squared to nine, that's about 10. And so your exposure to gamma ray source reduces by a factor of three by just increasing the distance by a factor of three. So, um, so, so, so this distance is in the design part of the workplace, workplace or research or whatever arrangement. You try to put the sources so that they are as far away from you as you can. Um, if you don't need to directly handle the source, then you don't. Now, if you somehow need to handle it directly, then you use an instrument to not directly touch the source, but you know, be at some distance so that, um, so that you are not, you get as much distance uh, as you can. And shielding is really the last and the final measure. It's uh, something that's uh, um, meant to come into play when it's not practical to limit time or distance to the extent you can. Uh, and shielding is also used in storage because uh, that's where sometimes people can accidentally expose themselves to radiation without knowing that they are. So shielding is really the uh, last measure. And especially, um, with uh, something like gamma rays, which is where shielding is most needed, is sometimes uh, the shielding actually uh, limits your dexterity. It limits how quickly you can move. It limits uh, uh, how much time it takes to do certain task with the source. So sometimes trying to get more shielding in place kind of um, conflicts with limiting the time. In those cases, you know, if you can. So, so people who work with the gamma ray sources, they often are not wearing heavy leaded gloves because it's much more effective for them to have glove free hand or you know, wear light gloves and work with the source quickly and be as far away from that as they can be quickly. So uh, shielding is the last measure. It's done either as a fail safe in case some tourists come around who don't <laughs> know that there's a radioactive source around and um, to save, to, um, to safeguard the people who don't know better, that's one, and to um, in the circumstances where time and distance alone are, are not enough. So, so yeah, that's uh, the radiation safety. And since I'm on the video here I, and I'm in my office, I thought I would actually show you this. Um, so because again, those makes the poison. And so, um, Oh wow, is this not opened? I thought I opened it. Um, so there are places 
that will sell you radioactive sources. These are what's called exempt quantity uh, sources. I get these for a lab that we do in physics 4C called the cloud chamber, where we are detecting radiation within the cloud chamber. And this company sells it to me without um, me having to go through a lot of bureaucratic stuff because this is exempt quantity. These sources are so weak. So um, they are of small enough uh, activity that when you do the estimate of, okay, how much exposure would a person get, those amount turn out to be very small amount. So, so, um, so, so that's how they establish what quantity is considered exempt. So let me just turn, pull out one of them. Some of these other sources are for other things. So this is a uh, um, exempt quantity cobalt, cesium, um, cobalt and cesium sources. And it, because these are very um, low amount of radioactive material, I feel completely fine handling it without any other special instruments. And these are also sealed sources meaning there's a very little chance of me accidentally swallowing the radioactive material in it. <laughs> um, now, having said that, even though it's a exempt quantity and it's not gonna cause me any harm, even if I hold it in my hand like this, I'm not gonna walk around holding this in my pocket like this. Like that would be stupid thing to do. Again, the principle is as low as reasonably achievable. It's unreasonable for me to walk around with this in my pocket. Like I have no reason to do that. It's reasonable for me to store this far away in a cabinet where I'm not near. Um, because again, the thing with the radiation safety is not, it's not a racing game of can you reach the background radiation level? It's a, whatever precautions you can take reasonably, you take it. But you do recognize that there are circumstances where uh, you have to balance between precautions that can be taken and precautions that are unreasonable to take. And uh, when you are at that balance, uh, you have you you are at the you know what they call alara. You've uh, reduced your radiation exposure uh, to as low a degree as uh, can be reasonably achieve, achieved. So um, yeah, so. So this is the radiation source. Um, so for in the context of physics of 4C lab, our Alara procedure is that I only bring out this source when we are doing cloud chamber lab. I don't uh, leave this lying around. It's locked in a cabinet. I only bring it out once a semester when we have these labs. And, um, and, um, and usually these sources, I'm the one handling it directly. The sources that most students are handling directly is actually this source. And this is a, it's a polonium source, and it's, a, um, it's a actually specifically designed to be held in such a way that um, the radioactive source is at the tip here. And so the way students are usually handling it, it's naturally already a few centimeters away from them. It's also an alpha source, so the air between the tip and their finger will actually um, show them. So the most dangerous thing that they can do is uh, you uh, poke their skin with it and it, it's a dull needle. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, that's a kind of radiation thing. This came out to be a lot longer than I was uh, uh, hoping it would be. I just went on. Uh, let me see here. Yeah. So <laughs> Yeah, so I see a comment question about uh, outpatient x-ray labs where uh, lead line the half wall that the technicians are stepped behind. That could be sufficient. It's a question of how thick that lead is. So they have a kind of lead blanket that they put over you and those are not very thick. That's a, like uh, definitely less than a centimeter because lead is heavy. So that shields you to a degree and uh, the point is that the level of shielding that something like that personal protective equipment provides, it's very minimal. So, and, but you know, for the patients, it's reasonable to provide it. So they do it. And for patients, it's enough. But for technicians, even if they were wearing that lead apron, it would not protect them sufficiently. 
That's why they either step out of the room where they are far enough away from radiation producing source, or they are in a specifically de designated area of the room where they someone has looked at it in detail and made sure with all the shielding in the wall or whatever that uh, where they are standing, they are exposure to radiation over the number of hours that they're expected to be exposed will be reasonable. So, so okay, uh, let me um, stop that there.